what I'm talking about today is, for me, the essence of economics. And if, how many people here are economics majors? Raise your hand. How many people have taken an economics course? Raise your hand. So you learn, when you take economics, you have an idea of what it is. And if I asked you, if I said, would you write down on a, we're not, we're not going to do it. But if I said, take a minute and write down what's economics, I think we'd all have a different answer. If I asked somebody out in the hall, who's not in this seminar, what's economics, or when I'm on an airplane and I say I'm an economist, uh, they say usually that must be uh, useful for when you do your taxes. <laughs> and I don't do my taxes. I pay somebody to do my taxes. I haven't, I don't, I'd be really bad at doing my taxes. Or they say, oh, what should I invest in? And I tell them uh, I don't have any investment advice except that most investment advice is dangerous. So be careful, and that's not very helpful to them. So they think it's about the stock market, interest rates, unemployment, taxes. And of course, it's about those things somewhat. But for me, economics is much, much, much deeper than those things. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a lens for looking at the world. And in my case, I think the deepest thing that we understand about economics is what I'm going to share with you today, which is goes under different names. Sometimes it's called spontaneous order. Sometimes it's called emergent order. Sometimes it's called complexity. Sometimes we call it a market. And I'm going to argue that all those things don't really capture what I'm really trying to share with you today, which is what happens when you leave things alone? What gets set in motion? What are the natural forces that occur in the world when you leave things alone. And I'm going to try to give you a feel for that today, what I mean by leave things alone and natural forces, an organic natural process. But what we're really doing when we look at the world this way is we're trying to see things that are invisible, see things that are hidden, see things that are not obvious, see things that economics helps us see that we wouldn't see otherwise. And that's what, to me, is the most important part of economics. So to me, what this conference is about is what happens when you leave things alone. And sometimes when you leave things alone, things turn out great. Sometimes they don't turn out well at all. Sometimes they're a disaster. But it's shocking that sometimes leaving things alone can be a good idea. Now, we know as human beings, leaving things alone is very difficult, right? Um, some of you, anybody here a parent? So when, you, when you're a parent, you start to learn about the, the challenge of leaving things alone versus control. Because you really want to control your kid. You really want to make them do what you want them to do. But strangely enough, they're a human being like you are. They want control also. See, you know, it's crazy, right? You made them. You're the boss. And yet somehow they have their own mind about what they want to do, what you want to do. And sometimes you have to learn to leave them alone. And as they get older, you have to leave them alone more and more. And that's very challenging, because we have a tremendous desire for control. Take last night. I'm lying in bed. It's 12.30. A nine-year-old is rolling a large suitcase down the hall and banging it down the stairs. Did anybody hear that last night? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I just got to let go of control. I can't control this. I have an urge to burst out into the hallway. Did, Anybody do this? I, I had an urge to burst out in the hallway and, and start screaming, stop that, what are you doing? Do you know it's 12.30? But I didn't. I tried to go back to sleep and say, I'm, I'm not in control. This is just part of life. I can't control this. But it's very hard for us because most of the time in our daily lives, if you want to achieve something, you have to take control. And you're taught that over and over again, right? Don't just sort of float through life. Take control. So if you have cooked a large dinner for a bunch of people, and there's a big pile of dishes in the sink, you can't just step back and say, oh, they'll probably clean themselves. Right? You got to take control. You got to clean them. You got to make a plan. You got to execute the plan with the soap and the water. And you got to, that's how you get clean dishes. So if you want to solve the problem of dirty dishes in the kitchen, you got to exert control. You got to take control. You can't leave things alone. But my lesson for today is that public policy, a nation's economy, the way that business and 
private organizations interact with government is not like the kitchen. But we have this natural impulse from the kitchen to exert control. When I say give up control, I don't mean literally, in the case of government, doing nothing. Okay? So I'm not an anarchist. You guys know that word, bevrit? I'm sure it's anarchy or something, right? Right? So I'm not an anarchist. A government has many crucial things to do, and as I suggested last night in my question to the speaker, I don't think it would have been a good thing for the government just to say, oh, you found the oil, you found the natural gas, thank you, good luck. Right? I understand you have to, there are many situations where government has to play sometimes a role of building the roads, having legal systems, all kinds of defense, and sometimes in the case of a natural resource set up on publicly owned land, there's going to be issues of what the government's role has to be. But I'm talking about cases where the government can step back, and what happens if the government doesn't do anything other than those basic functions? So I want to take a very simple example. First, I want to mention uh, unintended consequences, that the idea that when we exert control, good things happen, or more, care, more precisely, that if I want to achieve something, I make a plan and then I execute it, we understand that in a complex world, in a world where things are interconnected, sometimes the things we want to achieve are not the things that we do achieve, right? The equivalent would be we go to clean the dishes and we break them, right? Because we're not good at it. So for example, you know, tragically, my, the best example of this is often in foreign policy, where George Bush thought, wouldn't it be great to have a democracy in the Middle East? And he encouraged elections in Gaza, and he gets Hamas. That wasn't the plan, <laughs> right? Or he invades Iraq, deposes Saddam Hussein, and then Iran becomes the most powerful nation in the Middle East outside of Israel. That wasn't the plan. But things happen that you don't intend, right? Very, very important idea. Unintended consequences. Things that happened that wasn't part of the plan, that weren't part of the plan, right? So you always have to keep that in mind when you have try to exert control. But I want to start with the idea of not exerting control, leaving things alone. And I take the simplest, one of the simplest examples, which is bread, lechem. How can it be that every day in Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, Neve Ilan, everywhere in Israel, everywhere in the United States, everywhere in France, everywhere in Italy, meaning everywhere, even in Svedia. Did I say that correctly? Svedia, sorry. I like to pr practice my Hebrew. <clears throat> so how is it that it, countries that have lots of government, not so much government, lots of free market, pretty free market, the bread problem solved every day by not doing anything. What is the, the bread problem? Every day there are millions of people in Israel, millions of people in the United States, millions of people in Italy who are going to wake, wake up in the morning and want to have a piece of bread. Who's in charge of making sure that there's going to be bread? Who's in charge of making sure that there's bread in Yerushalayim? There's that horrible traffic, you got to get up the hill. Somehow, the flour and the bread gets there every single day. You never, ever, ever go to the shuk, don't go to Machne Yehuda and say, and go to get bread. And then, oh, yeah, we're, sorry, we're out today. We, just, we, didn't, we didn't get enough flour. We used it all up yesterday. Never happens. Never, ever, ever. How can that be? How can it be that every person in Israel who wants a pencil Anybody still using a pencil today? Anybody have a pencil with them? Most people use pens, but still there are people who use pencils. Every school ch child in Israel, every kid in school has a pencil, can buy a pencil. In America, you can buy a pencil. You think, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's kind of a big deal because over the last 10 or 20 years, about 300 million Chinese people have gone from the farm to the city in China and they start sending their kids to school. And those Chinese kids want pencils. So it could be, it isn't true, but it could be that when you go into the store to buy a pencil, 
They could say, oh, no, we sent all the pencils to China this year. Don't you know? We had to make an extra 100 million. So think about the following question. When they made an extra 100 million pencils for the Chinese, who got less? You know, they make pencils out of wood and paint. Did, were there people who didn't get wood? Were there people who couldn't? get a pencil somewhere in the world because the Chinese wanted an extra 100 million? Were there 100 million children somewhere else who couldn't get a pencil? What's the answer? No, that didn't happen. Does anybody here like American football? Have you heard of the Super Bowl? Super Bowl is a big deal in America. It's a big deal around the world. The Super Bowl is the biggest day in America for pizza. More pizza is sold on Super Bowl Sunday than any day in the year, by a huge amount. Can you imagine, like my wife, who's not interested in the Super Bowl, I don't know how, how that happens, some mystery of life. I married someone who's not interested in the Super Bowl, but it happens. So imagine my wife going into a, her favorite coffee shop and asking for a croissant, a crescent, French thing, a croissant, beverage, croissant. So, and they say, are you kidding? It's Super Bowl Sunday. There is no flour for croissants. They all went to pizza. All the flour got used for pizza. This is really scary. On Super Bowl Sunday, the number of chicken wings, it's also the biggest day for chicken wings. The number of chicken wings, you know how many, this is, this is the 2016 number. I don't have the 2017 number. The 2000, it's a very inaccurate number. Um, sometimes when I'm at the seminar, I give a talk on statistics and how misleading statistics can be. And I may give an extra curricular short thing on that if you're interested. But, on Super Bowl Sunday, they sold one, in America, 1.3 billion chicken wings. Now, I said it's kind of a funny statistic because a wing is really, it's two parts, or it could be three parts. Is a chicken, when I says 1.3 billion, does that mean 1.3 billion individual little pieces or the full wing cut in two, so it's really 2.6 billion little pieces? I don't know. I do know. I put no in quotes because it's not true. It's 37 million more chicken wings than in 2015. They increased by 37 million. Of course, that's a rounding error in 1.3 billion. I don't, how, I don't know how accurate the whole count is to suggest that you could actually tell that it increased by 37 million out of 1.3 billion is kind of funny. But anyway, imagine the week after the Super Bowl going into a restaurant and ordering chicken wings. Oh, are you kidding? We ate them all last week. They're gone. No, they're there. You can have them. So who's in charge of this? Who makes sure that all that stuff's available? And the answer, of course, is who? Nobody. There's nobody. Nobody's in charge. It works fine. It works great. It works so great you don't even think about it. You've never thought about it before. You've never probably thought about how it is that there's this process that no one is in charge of that produces, in English the word is a cornucopia. I'm sure that's the Hebrew word also. It's a crazy word, right? Does that word work? Cornucopia? Karen Ashefa, right? You have a Karen Ashefa of, of so many things. How can that be with no one is deliberately planning, intending, designing that to happen? I mean, that's just absurd. There's no minister of flour to make sure that the pizza guy doesn't get all of it. There's no minister of bread to make sure that, like, I like rye bread. Like, what's your favorite kind of bread? Whole wheat. Um, bread with olives. Bread with olives. Whole wheat. Doesn't care. Doesn't care. Doesn't have a favorite. Anybody else have a favorite? What? Baguette. Baguette. Right, so people have different preferences, and yet somehow you don't have to lobby. There's no one to lobby. 
There's no one to beg. There's no one to entreat. There's no one to ask, oh, could you make sure there's enough rye or whole wheat this week? Because last week we didn't get any. So I want you go to the government minister of bread to say, you know, I think we need to make more, let's have a protest, more whole wheat, more whole wheat. You don't have to. It's always there, every day. You don't have to call ahead. You're going to throw a party. You go to the place you usually go to. You're going to have 10 people over for breakfast. You don't have to say, oh, you know, I usually only get three bagels, but I'm going to get three dozen tomorrow. Could you make sure you make enough for me? It's all there. Just waits. It's all there. Nobody to call. No. And here's the weird thing. There's nobody to thank. Who do you thank for this Karen Beshefa? No, there's no person. It's a thousand, a million, it's more than a thousand. There's a million people. When you pick up, when you walk into your bakery or your grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread, a million people or more have been involved in that bread and you've never thought about it. It's not just the person who baked it. It's not just the person who drove the truck that delivered the flour to the bakery. It's not just the person who, the people who built the truck or the ovens or the farmer who grew the wheat or the machines that the farmer, I mean, if you think about the, the web of cooperation that has to take place every single day to be, bring fresh bread to your table and no one's in charge of that, that it just sort of emerges, it just sort of comes about. So how does that happen? So the great economist Hayek, H-A-Y-E-K, the great economist Hayek, in a paper, a, an article I recommend, that he wrote in 1945 called The Use of Knowledge in Society. I'll tell you about it. I'll give you a link to it later. You can find it on the web. He called it a marvel. He said, we don't appreciate it. It's so spectacular, and we don't appreciate it. So I just want to suggest two things that help make that marvel work. One is competition, and the other is prices. So the prices can adjust. So the reason that bread is available in Italy and Svedia and the United States and Israel and even in Greece, which has a messed up economy, is because they pretty much leave the prices alone and they let the prices send the signals about what people want to buy. And then there's the profit and the loss, which send a signal. So if you shop at a place and you like it, they make money. And if nobody likes it, they lose money and they go out of business. So no one has to decide, I don't think they're doing a good job. It happens automatically through the profit and loss system, through the prices that signal what people want, and through the competition that allows you to shop somewhere else if you don't like the job that they're doing. So I like to quote Walter Williams, who was my colleague when I used to teach at George Mason University. He said, here's my relationship with my grocery. I don't tell them when I'm coming. I don't tell them what I want to buy. And I don't tell them how much I want. But if they don't have it when I get there, I fire them. Right? I go somewhere else. If the shelves are empty, if they're not good at getting ready for my arrival, I just don't shop there anymore. That freedom to shop where you want is incredibly powerful because it's constantly sending a signal about what's working and what's not working. I argue that the price system is like a thermostat. Right, you know what a thermostat is, right? You set the thermostat, it gets cold outside, the heat comes on. It gets hot outside, the air conditioning comes on. It's really smart, but it's not smart. It's dumb. It's just a little piece of metal in there that's, a, that's reacting. But you leave it alone. Once you set it, you don't have to go in constantly, oh, I need to be warmer or colder. The thermostat figures it out. The price system is like a thermostat that builds itself. No one said, let's build a thermostat for goods called the price system. It just kind of happens also. It's like you go to build a house and suddenly a thermostat is on the wall automatically. I mean, that's a great thing. So if you let there be competition and you leave the prices alone, you get plenty of bread. And when you mess with the price of bread, you get Venezuela. So in Venezuela, there's no bread. And people fight and tragically kill each other over the fact, trying to get at bread and food and medicine and other things because they have tried to tinker with the system. My favorite quote of, probably, of, of F.A. Hayek, 
who I mentioned earlier is, he says, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. The curious tax, ta task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. Meaning, I think I can do this, but no, oh, it doesn't turn out the way I want. That's the unintended consequences idea. What that allows, which is, again, unappreciated, is harmony, harmonia. We get along. In Venezuela, they don't get along. Because if you want more bread, you've got to take it from someone. In our world, you want more bread, it just, you don't have to take it from anyone. The system produces more bread. Who said gluten-free? Did somebody say gluten-free? If you don't want gluten in your bread, you want gluten-free bread, you can have that too. Somebody decide, you don't call someone and say, you know, I really like some gluten. It just, all of a sudden, there it is on the shelf. It's crazy. That's happening all the time. And that lets us get along. And it lets us get along in all kinds of ways. One of the ways it lets us get along is that my plans for my party, my brunch, my Super Bowl party, my party the week after the Super Bowl, that can go forward with your plans, which is you don't like the Super Bowl and you want croissants. You want to have a party without pizza. Somehow, we can get along that way without having to fight over it or negotiate. It just sort of happens. So that harmony, which allows planning by us as individuals, think about how, what a paradox. What's the paradox, Bivreed? Paradox? What a paradox it is. There's no one planning the whole system, but that lets you and I plan individually for what we want to do with our lives. I mean, that my, I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's such a crazy example. In America, in every city with more than 20,000 people, there's a sushi restaurant. And if it's a big city, it has lots of sushi restaurants. Who's the minister of sushi restaurants who decide, oh yeah, well, now they've got more than 20,000 people, let's assign them a sushi chef. And you know, It just happens. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's an amazing thing. So what do you call this? This, this system of competition, profit and loss, prices, you could call it Spontaneous order, I don't like that word so much, but that phrase, I like emergent order. Emergent in English means it sort of comes up on its own. You could call it complexity, complex order, or you could call it a market. So that's the shorthand in, in economics. We call it, oh, there's a market for bread. That's what we use. And that's a very powerful shorthand, except for one problem. It encourages people to think that markets which use money are what emergent order is about, and it's not. Because there are many, many things that are emergent that have nothing to do with money that solve problems also. Okay? And so what I want to spend the last part of my talk on it, then I'm going to show you this little uh, video. There are many things that work well. There are many problems that get solved without money. And I'm going to talk about a few of those. Before I do, I want to make it clear. There are many problems that don't solve themselves in the public policy arena. Okay, Again, what did I say at the beginning? I'm not an anarchist. Pollution. Dumping poison into the air, into the water, is not going to solve itself. Why not? Why, why can't I just say, oh, I just let the air clean itself? Why doesn't the air clean itself the way the bread shows up on Super Bowl Sunday and at the week after and the week before? Do you benefit from cleaning the air? I know what you meant, but, but, but isn't it strange? A lot of people benefit, right? So why doesn't it, there should be a, it should solve itself. Why doesn't it? There's no market, but what does that mean? That's just words, right? What, what, there's what? There is collective need, but there is no personal. But 
we're all motivated, right? Now, there's words for it in economics, free rider problem, there's a, a prisoner's dilemma, blah, 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 externality, blah, blah, blah. But what's the real essence of the problem? You can't make money <laughs> cleaning the air, right? You can't make a profit. You can't start, I'm going to start a business cleaning the air, right? It's hard, you know, why that is, is related to what? The free rider problem, I, you're not going to, there's a public good, for those of you who know the words, we don't have to go into it now. But for those of you who don't know the words, the problem is you can't make a profit. Now, it's not literally true. There is a profit motive. There is a profit incentive to clean the air. Do you know what it is? As a business, it's better not to pollute. Because what pollution is, it means I didn't use everything, right, that, that when I made the product. I wasted something. So I have a natural incentive, but it's not a big enough incentive. So for example, we want to preserve resources. We talked about a little bit last night for the next generation. You guys aren't old enough, but when I was a little boy, so this is 1960, OK? I'm six years old in 1960. In 1960, if you wanted to show how strong you were, you took a soda can, not a bottle, but a can, and you crushed it. Because in 1960, you couldn't crush a soda can unless you were really strong. Today, you can crush a soda can with two fingers, right? You can crunch it in. What changed? Hmm? The thickness. The thickness. How, why didn't they change it before? Because they didn't have a way to allow the cans to stack on each other. If you look at a soda can, the rim on the top is a little thicker, right? That's a genius idea because that allowed the rest of the can to be very thin, which means you don't have to spend as much money on aluminum, which means you make more profit. But of course, you don't necessarily make more profit because there's competition. And other soda can makers can do that too. And then you end up giving the profit back in the form of lower prices because of competition. But for a while, you can make some extra money. And as a result, no one said, wouldn't it be great for the world if we use less aluminum? No, they said, wouldn't it be great for me if we use less aluminum? But that's not enough of an incentive to keep people from polluting the air and polluting the water. So you've got to have government solve that problem. You can't have that problem solve itself unless you want dirty air. It's not going to solve itself. So nothing I'm saying today is saying the government should do nothing. There are a lot of things the government should do, and there, you, you could debate about how to do them and what it does well and what it does not so well. But what I'm interested in is giving you an idea that isn't so obvious, which is that when I say leave things alone, get the government out of X, out of some activity, so the government's out of bread, more or less. There may be some subsidies in certain countries, certain interve interventions. But in general, you can leave bread alone. And everybody gets good bread, cheap bread, lots of choice. Okay. But when I say leave things alone, you might think, should not be true, you might think, therefore, I think everything should be done by the market. And I want to use that term for the moment to describe things that involve money, profit and loss, business. Okay. So there's a natural tendency to think the opposite of government is business. So if I don't think government should solve the problem, it means I think business should solve the problem. That's not a good way to think about it. It's not the way I think about it. When I say I want the government to let, leave it alone, I want to let, let me say it differently, the opposite of government is not business. The opposite of government is voluntary. Voluntary. Government is coercive. What's the word be for it? What is it? Fia. Government is, which is fantastic if you know what you're doing. Because I can, with the power of, gu of a gun, the force of the law, I can decide what to do. Now, of course, it doesn't work that way really, right? Because the government passes a law, oh, drugs are illegal, no more drugs. Doesn't work, right? Government cannot stop people from taking marijuana, can't stop people from taking cocaine, can't stop people from taking heroin. It's hard for people to understand, but it might be better to not make it illegal, right? 
but it's certainly not true that by making it illegal, it's over. That is not true, right? But government can do lots of things. It can take your money, right, and use it to, to buy things, create things, give it to other people. It's really good at that. Not perfect. Why? People cheat on their taxes, right? Can't get every money, penny it thinks it can get. Taxes discourage people from doing certain things, so there are side effects from taxes. Right, Robert? It's the way the world works. People, there's incentives, right? So government, when it says, oh, I'll just fix this. I like to use the example of, uh, of the Wizard of Oz. How many people have seen the Wizard of Oz or know about the movie? Right? It's just like, oh, magical wizard, please give me courage. Give me, take me back to Kansas, solve my problems. Well, there is no Wizard of Oz, right? There's no Wizard of Oz. The government's not the wizard. The government can't solve things magically. It doesn't have a magic wand, right? But it can do lots of things because it has the power of force. But what I'm suggesting today is that voluntary solutions sometimes are better than force. Not always. Pollution is an example. But a lot of times, voluntary is better. And the thing I want to, you to see that maybe you haven't thought of is that voluntary doesn't mean business only. So I want to give you three ways that we work together to solve problems, three ways. We usually think of two ways. I'm going to give you three ways. The first way is the government way. How do we work together to solve problems through the government? Raise your hand. How do we do that? What's the mechanism? What's the, how's that system work? The law? What else, though? Elections, right? We vote. We raise money for candidates. How's that system work? Eh, pretty good. It's pretty good. Got some problems. The voting only occurs every two and a half years. In America, every four years or two years or six years, depending on who you're electing. All right? And that, that exerts some control on the politicians. But how often do I vote on my bakery? Every day. Every day. They don't, they don't make me happy, I leave. I have other choices. Politics is very blunt. It's imperfect. And Johanna is going to talk about it more. But sometimes that's all we've got. We can't use a voluntary system. You can't use a vol it's very hard to use a voluntary system to fund, say, national defense, pollution, etc. So we're going to use the coercive power of the government. And we're going to try to make it work through the democratic process, through elections, through a constitution, if you have one, through parliament, through the Knesset, et cetera, et cetera. That's one way we work together to solve problems. I'm going to give you two other ways. One I've talked about, that's bread. There's a problem. How do you get bread every day to the people of Jerusalem, to the people of Tel Aviv, to the people of Athens, to the people of New York, to the people of Paris? And the way you do that is you just stand back as the government. By standing back, a million people work together to make bread, and it works great. So those are the two obvious ways. The coercive system of taxation, elections, and government, and the voluntary system of business. And in business, what's voluntary? Where I work, who I work for, who I hire, what I, who I invest in. Right? So if I'm a baker and I want to start a new bakery, I, I can't do it by myself. I have to join with other people. I have to join with other people to make the bread, to make the ovens, to make the trucks. I, I need to cooperate. I need to earn the trust of the people that I work with if they're going to keep working with me. I need to pay them enough to work for me. I need to promise enough to my investors to get them to give me money. So there's a voluntary cooperation that takes place in business that's very important. But there's a third sector that we don't often think about. And I think about it all the time for what happens when you leave things alone. And that's what we call in America the nonprofit sector, right? Charities, foundations, nonprofits. This is right now what we're doing, right this minute. This is a voluntary activity we're doing together with Bob, Corinne, Hananel, me, Robert, Yohanatan. Peter, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're coming together, 
No one's in charge of it. There has to be someone with the idea of it and to execute it. But the government doesn't exert any influence on it because we live in a free society, thank God. But that happens to solve this problem that maybe students in Israel don't know so much about free market economics, right? We're solving that problem. We're trying to solve that problem. That's a little example. My podcast is an example. It's not a for-profit enterprise. It's, I don't charge for it, but it's crazy. I get paid. They pay me something. My sound engineer gets paid. The person who puts it on the web gets paid. There's a bunch of servers that have to get paid for to keep the archives online. That's an amazing thing. There's no money. There's lots of money, but there's no profit. That's impossible. How does it happen? Donations. There's a foundation that funds it. Wikipedia is another obvious example, right? There's no profit. There's a little bit of reputation. If you're an editor on Wikipedia, you can show off if you want and say, I did that part. That was my section. You can correct a lot of mistakes and get a reputation. That's nice. But Wikipedia is impossible, according to economics. If you had asked the economists 25 years ago, will Wikipedia be exist? Impossible, because there's a free rider problem. Will it be any good? Well, it might exist, but it'll be awful. It'll be full of mistakes. There's no incentive to fix it. There's no profit motive. But there are other motives beside profit for making the world a better place. What are they? Love, compassion, empathy, altruism. They're very important. They're very important. They're part of the conversation. Never think that economics, oh, that's about money. No, economics is about the incentives people face in complex situations where they interact with each other. And there's a lot of potential and possibility for people to work together in nonprofits to solve problems. So I'm crazy. What makes me crazy, what makes me different, the reason I'm peculiar, is that I think where government should leave things alone is very different from where other people should think they should leave them alone. So personally, we're going to talk about, you can talk about this with me at dinner or lunch because it's, it's a 30-minute conversation. But I think government should get out of the school business in America, probably here too. Well, you guys have such good schools, K through 12. I'm sure you wouldn't want to make them better. <clears throat> here you got some issues, right? So in America, we have lots of issues. There are a lot of kids who have horrible education in, in America's cities. So I want government out of that business, out of it. Oh, then. Well, you want schools to be run like businesses? No, I don't. That's stupid. There are for-profit schools. They're not very good. The nonprofit schools in America are the best schools at the university level. The nonprofit schools at the K through 12, the before college, some of them are great. But there would be more of them, and they would be better if the government, I believe, if the government got out motivated by love, motivated by compassion, rachamim, right, chesed. Those are the things I think would save the school system, and those things are being pushed aside because of the coercive system of taxes and government provision of schooling that we have in the United States, and it doesn't work well. And if you think I'm wrong, which you probably do, your first thought is what? That's a horrible idea because in that world, Poor people wouldn't get good schools. Of course, poor people in America don't get good schools now, right? Really important to remember that it's a total failure right now for the last, oh, 50 or 60 years. And that's, to me, totally unacceptable. So I believe that the burden of proof is on the other side to justify the current system, which I think is an utter failure. But there are issues. You might ask, there are a lot of other issues, right? What about inequality? What about poverty? Is government, should government leave those things alone? And we could debate and discuss those, and I hope we do over the next few days. But my view is that in general, we don't appreciate the power and potential of voluntary cooperation to solve problems that could happen if government left more things alone than it does now. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to show you now. This is. Um, so I wrote a poem. Is anybody going to laugh? 
Come on. It's funny. I wrote a poem to try to describe this lecture. Okay, so this is a six minute version of what I just gave you in 45 minutes. Okay, so we animated the poem some, with the help of some colleagues at the Hoover Institution and some very talented animators in, uh, in California. And then we uh, created a soundtrack and I did the voiceover. And so we're going to, what I'm going to do with this poem, we're going to put it up on YouTube, of course, but we'll also embed it in a website that will have dozens of resources about emergent order. So if you want to, obviously in six minutes or 45 minutes, you can't convey all of the richness of this idea of leaving things alone. So this will have essays, books, articles, videos, audio, and it'll be up in about a month, and it'll be at wonderfulloaf.org, um, because the video is about bread, and the title of the video is, of the poem is, It's a Wonderful Loaf, which is a takeoff on the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which it kind of worked out nicely because it, how many people have seen It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart? So you should see it. It's a wonderful movie. Uh, it's a movie about a man who doesn't appreciate how good his life is. And so this poem is people who don't appreciate how good the bread market is. We'd love to hear and more about the inequality and poverty and how the government is It doesn't make it worse. It, in many ways, it makes it better, uh, poverty and inequality, uh, through the tax system and through redistribution. The question is, could it do a better job or could a private system do a better job, OK? Um, inequality is a big topic. We could talk for at least 45 minutes or an hour and a half about it. Let me just say something short. And um, I'm also creating a series of videos in um, which I'll show, again, if people are interested, maybe after dinner one night. Um, I have uh, the first two done. They're about 15 minutes altogether showing how difficult it is to measure inequality in the data. And there's a lot of uh, misperception and deception. But it's real. Obviously, there's lots of inequality. And it's growing here in Israel. And I think it's growing in the United States. And some of that is very good. Uh, when uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page created Google, they were very poor. And they became unbelievably rich. And I'm very happy for them because I get to use Google. And I really love, I, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine what life would be like without Google. We're so spoiled that we you know, talk about taking something for granted. The ability to look up something in a second. Uh, my grandfather, for about a decade, was tormented by the fact that he couldn't remember the poet who wrote the line, the strong man must go. He knew there was a poem. It had the strong men must go in it. It turns out it's a poem by Robert Browning. And he remembered it after about 10 years in a restaurant. He yelled out, Browning! And you know, scared 40 or 50 people, probably. And I can solve that problem in a, a, less than a second <laughs> by putting in quotes, the strong man must go. And you get Google. And I mean, it's an amazing thing. So that's the good kind of inequality, in my opinion. Some people should say, well, they owe us more than they give us. They should be taxed more. They're taxed a lot, but they should be taxed more. And that's a legitimate argument. There's no, economics has no, almost nothing to say about that. You know, you might think one thing, I might think something else. Uh, that's not interesting to argue about, right? Um, to me, what's interesting to argue about is the other kinds. Let me mention a couple other kinds of inequality that have grown. So technology is one example. Why is it that the inventors and innovators and entrepreneurs in today's world are so much richer than other people in our world? And compared to other rich people before, the gap between the richest and the average, or the richest and the median, the richest and the bottom, is so much bigger than before. Because the world's more connected, right? So if I create something fabulous, I don't just sell it in Haifa. Now I sell it to 7 billion people, right? If I'm a great athlete, if I'm LeBron James, 
it used to be LeBron James would be popular in Cleveland. Nice, you could get a LeBron James t-shirt in Cleveland. Then you could buy a LeBron James t-shirt all over America. But now you can buy a LeBron James t-shirt all over the world, and they want to. People in China and Italy and Afghanistan want a LeBron James t-shirt because they can watch him on the internet, which they couldn't do before. So LeBron James's salary relative to the person in the stands who watches LeBron James is much bigger than the difference between the salary of Magic Johnson in 1979 or 1980 and the person in the stands because in 1980 there was no internet and people in China didn't care about basketball in America. But now that's all changed. You're a great singer. You have a great voice. In 1850, You'd had a nice living because everybody in the town wanted to hire you for their wedding. It's an example from Nassim Taleb, right? You're an, you're an Italian. Your name's Enrico Caruso. You're a great singer. But before the recording of voices, you were just a nice singer at all the local dinners and parties and, and celebrations and weddings. But then you can go to, think about this. Somebody invents electric light, which is a, an amazing thing, right? Now you can, at night, you can have a room where 3,000 people can listen to you sing at night because you can light up the room and you can broadcast the voice. In his case, you don't need to broadcast it. You didn't need a microphone. So you have that technology of the light changed entertainment because you could have entertainment in the evening instead of just in the daytime. But then you get the record, something you guys have never seen. A piece of plastic made out of vinyl made out of oil, taken from the ground, incredible thing, actually. What a miracle. You could take oil out of the ground and make something you could record a voice on and hear it whenever you wanted. And then you go to this? I mean, this is unbelievable. In, I like to say, in 1750, if you were really rich, and I'm going to go the other way and show you how much less, less inequality there is. In 1750, if you were really, really rich, you could hire five musicians to follow you around and play music whenever you wanted, right? That's fantastic. It's like music in your pocket in 1750, right? But you, you, how many songs could five people know? 80, 100, that would be amazing, right? They're fantastic, right? Now everybody, poor people, rich people, get 10,000 songs. You can, every people here use Spotify. It's the most extraordinary, I think it's 36 million songs. I have access to 36 million songs in my pocket if I have Wi-Fi? That's absurd. When I was a little boy, when I was, a young, when I was in college, there was a comedian named Robert Klein. He used to have a joke. This was a joke. You know how on late night television in America, I don't know if they have it here, they advertise crazy things, silly things. And his silly thing was, you're going to get every record ever recorded. We're going to come to your house with a big truck. Think about that. That was a joke, right? Like if you wanted all the music of the world in 1975, a truck wasn't was maybe you could fit it on a truck, a few trucks. Now I don't. <laughs> it's all here. It's it's absurd. So the world's very very amazing, and the people who made it amazing, and the people with the voices, and the people with the talent to bring me the voices, they get really really rich. Okay, I love that. I hope that is a great thing. But then there are people who get really, really rich by going to the government and keeping out their competitors or getting a special favor or handout. We, in America, we call it crony capitalism. Here, you, I think you talk about tycoons, right? That's evil. That's disgusting. That's the wrong way to get rich. And the more you let that happen, in America in 2009 and 2008, we had bailouts of banks to, quote, save the economy. But what we did is we told people that when you do bad things, you don't have to pay for them. That's a terrible precedent. And we rewarded people who were already incredibly wealthy with more wealth. That was a disaster. That's also part of the inequality, and I think that's horrible. So the first thing I would say is there's different kinds of inequality. The second thing I would say is that I worry more about poverty than inequality. I worry that people do. So what I'm really interested in deep down and what I think the economy should be doing is not making us rich. I mean, rich is nice. Right? Money is nice. But money is not what makes us happy. What makes us happy is the ability to le sig sug. But le sig sug in not just 
monetary ways. Lefriach, is that a good word? To, to flourish, we say in English, to blossom, to use my skills, to find meaning in my life, to be respected, to be honored, to be kind and, and ha have the respect of the people around me. That's what makes me, that's what gives life its real meaning. Or it's a big part of what gives life meaning. The other part is religion or other things you care about, whether it's helping others, whatever it is. But just for your own personal life, the thing that makes you, your, makes you content, makes you satisfied, is having the respect of the people around you. And if the economy doesn't allow you to find a place, then that's a problem. So that's what I worry about. Are there people who are not able to find a place? And in America, which I know better than Israel, but I'm sure you have the same problem, there are people who can't find a place. I don't mean a home. I mean a, a less, what's the right way to say it? Does that word place, a makom, and does that have the same meaning, bivrit? Meaning a, 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 a place where I belong, a place where I have pride, my, where I, I feel important, where I'm contributing. If I don't have the skills to do that, then I'm in trouble. So there's a very serious issue right now in the world about automation and, and artificial intelligence whether it's going to take that away from a lot of people. I mean, I'll give you a good example. I love the idea of a driverless car, right? Autonomous vehicles, right? Driverless cars. Fantastic. It'll save 35,000, if it works the way they claim it will, I don't know if it really will, could save 35,000 lives, right? 35,000 lives. And people say, oh, it had an accident. Yeah, right, one accident. The, the, 35,000 people die every year in America from car accidents. Then you have people who are old and can't drive a car anymore, and can't get around, and whose lives are miserable. You have people who can't afford a car but could maybe take a, a drive now and then. So autonomous cars are fantastic. But there are millions of people right now who drive cars, taxis, and trucks. I, I'm not sure what they're going to do. It's not obvious they're going to easily find a place. A new job, a place to find meaning. Oh, we'll just give them money. Well, we'll because we'll save so much money from cars, we'll have lots of money to give them. It's not the same. We're not the same. So that's a little thing on inequality, on poverty. I think the issue is whether the current system serves the poor well, which mainly in America, and I think here also, gives them a, a menu, a buffet of things. Some money, some health care, some food stamps, some education, et cetera, and a lot of those things are bad. They're not done well. So the question is whether a private system motivated by both love and money, profit and compassion, would work better. And we'll talk about that some more maybe. But that, I think there's a, it's an interesting discussion to have. People say, we tried that in 1750. It was miserable. Yeah, in 1750, it didn't work very well. People were really poor. Most people were poor, and that private charity didn't solve that problem. Could it solve the problem now? I think it could have a, it would be interesting to think about. I, I'm much more confident it could solve some of the problems. It could solve the problem of health care for the poor. It could solve the problem for education for the poor. Would it solve all of poverty? Prob maybe not. It wouldn't raise as much money because of the issues we talked about before. There's a free rider problem. There's, there are people who could say, I'll let other people take care of it. So it wouldn't be perfect, but the current system is not perfect either. It's always important to remember. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you know how wonderful, thank you very much. And uh, you know how what's interesting is that the market is so powerful and we don't really understand it or don't rationalize it most of the time. But then, interestingly, some people who they're so obsessed, vilifying the world, uh, got the upper hand in history of so many occasions, especially in the 20th century. Yes. And you have an example of the Soviet Union. I, I was born in the Soviet Union. And I'm still puzzled how that was possible that it existed for so long that people were so misguided by distrusting the market and creating all these systems of alternative management, centralized management. Uh, which brings me to my main point, which might uh, entertain you. You know what they invented? Back to your account. The Ministry of Bread. There was the Ministry of Bread in the Soviet Union. Yeah. You said there was no the Ministry well, of Bread. Well, the time in America, America. America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. But there was actually a real oh, Ministry of sure. Bread. <laughs> so, you know, the, um, it's mind-boggling how far they attempted to undermine the market 
and to uh, so superimpose the system of alternative management, well, which was, of course, completely dysfunctional and ended up in collapse. But uh, it, it took a long time. It took a <laughs> very long time, and it's amazing how people can be guided by these perceptions and the lack of knowledge of economics. And when those people get into politics, take power, maintain power by brutal force, then it can last for a very long time. And that's what worried. Well, yeah, the, there's, um, or it's not just the Soviet Union, but just an extreme example, right, of where an attempt originally to make the world a better place didn't make the world a better place. Let me tell you a story. This will abuse you. Uh, we used to live in St. Louis. <laughs> this is a true story. I, I wrote about it. I, I fictionalized it, but it's a true story, uh, meaning I fictionalized it in one of my books. But the, the, what really, here's what really happened. Uh, we were living in St. Louis, and this was uh, early 1990s when a lot of uh, Soviet Jews came out of the Soviet Union. Some came here, a lot came to America. And agencies, nonprofits in America, assigned American families to be helpers of these families to help them get used to American life. So I don't speak Russian, and they didn't speak English, so we we're on a big adventure. Uh, we have about like five Yiddish words together that didn't help at all. Um, many, many misunderstandings of language problems that were very funny. But we took them to the grocery. And of course, coming from the Soviet Union, an American grocery was like going to a museum. I mean, they, were, they wanted to just look at it. They wanted, especially the produce section with the vegetables and the fruit. They just wanted to admire it. And they just, they just were overwhelmed by the uh, Karen Besheffa that was there. Just so much stuff. It was, it was unimaginable. And then we wandered around. And then, funny for the video, the, the, uh, the mother of the family wanted to make, I somehow understood she wanted to make bread, which means she needed to buy yeast. We found the flour. But then she started talking about something else, and we knew she meant yeast. And in America, it's probably true here also, you know, yeast is small. Flour comes in these big containers, but yeast is these little packages. There's two kinds of yeast. There's dry and wet. Dry is in a little packet. Wet's in a little cube. It's hard to find. It doesn't take up much room. So I'm looking around. We can't find it. So I go to one of the managers. I said, I can't find the yeast. Oh, it's over here. Takes us to it. And it's, there isn't any. It's, they're out. They're not really out. They, they hadn't restocked it. They hadn't, it was in the back. So he says, just a minute. And he goes in the back and he brings out some yeast. And the mother looks at me like this. She got one of the important families who can get the yeast, right? <laughs> so that's the world of a uh, minister of bread. Some people get the bread, some people are on the inside, some are on the outside. But the question that you raise is the, the deep question of how does this persist, not just well, we know how it persisted in the Soviet Union. It, 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 it persisted through the gulag. It existed through threats of violence and prison and death and torture. The, the deeper question, which I think you're also asking, is how does the idea of it persist? And I want to make a, an important point I didn't emphasize enough, which is I, I think there's a host I want us to make it very clear. I am, I, am a, I am free market, which the way I like to describe it Sometimes I'm, I, I'm, I would describe myself as a libertarian, but I usually describe myself as a classical liberal, meaning a liberal of the 19th century when, and 18th century, Adam Smith and others wanted a role for government, but not a very big role, and more role for individual responsibility. Okay, so that's, that's my viewpoint. A lot of people think that means I'm pro-business. I am not pro-business. Business, business it's fine if they can survive, but if they don't survive, that's, too, that's good. Let them die, right? I don't want to bail out banks. I don't want to give special corporate welfare, which we have in the United States, and I'm sure you have it here. Politically powerful businesses get access to the political system and get special favors. That's a disaster for a classical liberal. Again, the opposite, oh, I'm, I'm kind of anti-government. Oh, you must be pro-business. No, I'm not. I'm pro-market, meaning businesses have to prove their worth. And if they can't, let them die. But the other thing that I think people have trouble with is that if you're in business, you must be motivated by what? 
money. But you can be motivated by things other than money and be in business, right? You can get satisfaction from the fact that your product, that, I mean, you don't, th people who make great bread, yes, they like the money. Yes, they're motivated by money. Yes, if you didn't have money, they, if it was a charity, they probably would have to do something else. They wouldn't be baking bread. They wouldn't be getting up at four in the morning, right? That's an amazing thing. You get up, probably three. You get up at three in the morning to make fresh bread. I mean, my, I have a wonderful wife, but she doesn't do that for me, right? But if you paid her, she would. Think about how crazy that is, right? But she doesn't because she's not a baker. She said she stays up till 10 o'clock grading exams because she's a math teacher. She's motivated by that. Oh, no, she does it for the money. No, she doesn't. She does it because she's, well, she kind of does it for the money. But it's more than just the money. She loves teaching. She loves math, right? If you didn't pay her, she wouldn't do it. She'd do something else. So money matters. But she also wouldn't do it if all it was was money. She has to enjoy what she's doing also or get some satisfaction. So we forget sometimes how important that is. All right? So when, what motivates us is lots of things. And so I think one of the reasons that anti-free market con centralized control is so popular throughout history is that, oh, people are motivated by money. They must not care about me. That can't be good. Well, actually, it can be. It can work fine. That's one of the lessons of economics, that it can work out OK, even if all they care about is the money. But it usually isn't all they care about. They usually care about the, the product they make and making their customers happy and the satisfaction they get from that. That's certainly part of the process, right? I mean, it's absurd the way we think about that. I mean, you would never argue that about for your own self. That's not what motivates you. It's a bunch of things. Yeah. Question? Yeah, um, I'm trying to phrase it. Particularly for what I understand from you is they say let's let schools and other things, education run itself, right? Like the private sector. Yeah. And by private sector I mean business, foundations, nonprofits, let whatever it gonna it's going to be emerge that serves the students the best. Is that right? Like, so you're gonna be paying for education or just getting donations? Both. Because some kids, right? I mean, in America, and I'm sure you have this here, we have this absurd situation where rich, rich people get stuff for free because it's a program for everybody, right? Right. So we have free education and free education. Where is uh, is Donna here? She, she, we're talking about what is it? Um, Ochle, but but what? Right. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Chinam. Right. Eating for free. I mean, why? Why am? Why am? Why are rich people, people who can pay, who can afford it, eating for free off other people's money? It's bizarre, right? So in America, we have a state university system that you've probably heard of. University of Michigan, University of North Carolina, where I was an undergraduate, University of California, UCLA, Berkeley. These are wonderful universities. Who, where, how are they funded? Through government, mostly, increasingly through private tuition payments also, but it's, also, it's subsidized by tax money. Who pays the taxes? Everybody. It's income tax, it's property tax, it's sales tax, all kinds of different taxes. Who goes to the universities? Rich kids. Kids from rich families, overwhelmingly. Oh, but it's cheap so that poor people can afford college. It, that's true, but you're letting rich people who can't afford it get, a, get a, a free deal also. Which, of course, all of it increases the demand, which pushes up the price which is we don't subsidize it enough. We need to subsidize it more, right? That's what we do with health care in the United States. We make it free for lots of people. Then we say, oh, see how expensive it is? We better make it free for more, right? We, 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 the idea of a free market in health care is considered, well, it's impossible. That would never work. So that's a whole long other story. But I didn't answer your question. No, so I just kind of want to understand. You're kind of saying that the government funding should go incrementally, so go like Correct. So I don't want. I don't want, let's, let's take retirement, okay? I've been paying into Social Security since 1967, since I was 13 years old, right? The, our retirement system in the U.S. government. I don't need Social Security. I've been blessed. I have enough money and I've saved enough money that I can live, comf I hope, comfortably without Social Security. I shouldn't get it, but I'm going to get it. They're going to send me the check. And people say, yeah, well, you, they should send it to you because you, you contributed. You paid in. You paid. Yeah, but they didn't keep my money for me. They sent it in America. What happens with Social Security money? 
that comes out of my paycheck. It's called so it's a special part of my paycheck tax called payroll taxes. And it goes to fund food stamps and the war in Iraq and everything else. It doesn't go to anybody's retirement because there's extra money in it. I didn't pay into my, not like my account. The government pretended I had an account. They, they keep track of how much I contributed. But they, it's not a contribution. It's forced. I would have preferred to have had the money when I was younger. And it's absurd that I'm going to collect a check because I don't need it. Right? It's absurd. I would much rather that money be spent better helping people who are poor, who, who were retired, who didn't save enough, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so I want, I want more private activity toward poor, for poor people, and I want government to spend its money more carefully. People say, oh, but if, <laughs> if the government didn't give it to you, then the system wouldn't be popular, the, the Social Security wouldn't be popular. I don't care if it's, that's so it's a trick. <laughs> it's a trick. Oh, we're saving it for you. I mean, I would much rather have it be spent more wisely, carefully, and effectively. Same with universities. It's absurd that a person who makes a ton of money can go to an American university at the same price as somebody who's poor. It's a nonprofit. It shouldn't be done as a, as a revenue-generating activity. It's absurd. Yeah, I want it redesigned. Is that the agenda of most people? No. Free I don't know. Everybody, they're all different, right? There's some... I, I'm on the fringe because I think this is possible. I'm in a, I'm on a debate. I'm, deb I'm in a debate right now on Twitter with someone else so trying to debate this. So I thought this is silly. And 140 characters this is not very effective. I'm going to write a little essay. Well, the essay is now 3,000 words, and I'm about a third of the way down. I'm, I'm writing a book on, without intending to, on how healthcare. How could it be that poor people? How could the market for healthcare work if it was a free market? The idea, here's the way people think about it. Oh, so I'd get a cure, I'd get cancer treatment, but a poor person would just die on the street. Well, that would be horrible. That would be a bad system. That would be, oh, you'll get the Mercedes, you'll get the doctor who's trained at, at Stanford, and the poor person will get the person who doesn't have a medical degree who's a pretend doctor. Well, that would be a bad snow. That's not the vision. That's not my vision, strangely enough. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, uh, anyway, so I think it's all possible. It might not work. I'm, I'm you know, it might not work. Yeah. But I have an I idea of how it could work. Yeah. Um, I think um, two good examples um, that may, uh, may show that it's problematic uh, in your approach is that, uh, first of all, I think the, uh, the issue of imp imprisonment that actually got into the Supreme Court of Israel that uh, said that giving uh, the, the, the ability uh, to private companies to uh, take out freedoms of others is problematic for prisoners. Also, I think one issue that was raised just like in the last few weeks is uh, that in insurance company um, that uh, took uh, did investig conducted the investigation for handicapped uh, people. Uh, so the government sees its duty to uh, to protect the freedoms of the people who uh, who are limited. Uh, who, who the limit the, the freedom is limited. Uh, prisoners, uh, handicapped people, in which a private company didn't care less about. Yeah, this. and that's a great example. So let let's let's talk about prisons first. Uh, I know a little bit more about that. Um, I'm not talking about privatization of government services, okay? That's a, you, you asked me, the most free market. So that's one flavor of free market. Uh, there's so many flavors. Like schooling, a lot of people say we should use uh, vouchers, right? Voucher -y, right? I'm against vouchers. I th for complicated reasons, I think that's a mistake. I would rather see the government get out of schooling altogether. But a lot of people say, well, no, we'll keep the government in it, but the vouchers will make it work better. It might. I, I have reasons to think it wouldn't, but that, that's a, there, there's a lot of different flavors. Privatization is another flavor. So when I say leaving things alone, that's not leaving things alone. That's, I don't know. It, it, I don't think that works very well in general, and in particular for exactly the reasons we're talking about. I don't think you want people taking care of prisoners who are motivated by money. It doesn't work very well. Of course, the current system doesn't work very well either. In America, I don't know how it works here in Israel, but the people who run prisons who work for the government 
strangely enough, they're not so nice either to the prisoners. It's a horrible. I did a very interesting podcast uh, interview with David Scarbeck, who wrote a book about the emergent order of prison gangs and legal systems within prisons among the prisoners. Some of the prisons have constitutions, they have elections, and they have all kinds of rules, right, in prison that are not written down. Some of them are, but some of them are by the prisoners, not by the guards. There are rules that emerge. In an American prison, you pretty much have to join a gang in the prison based on the color of your skin. So the white people all join a white gang, the Latinos all join a Latino gang, and the African Americans all join an African American gang. And it's very organized, but not by anybody in the prison. It's sort of a crazy emergent order. It's a fascinating thing. So prisons are a mess. They're not run well by the government. They're certainly not run well by a, by a private thing. Because if you think about the private thing, the private management, someone's got to monitor them to make sure they don't take advantage of the prisoners. What keeps the bakery from taking advantage of me? Competition. What keeps a prison management firm? Not competition. <laughs> it's not a good system. Probably. It might be better than the current system, but maybe not. This is definitely not what I'm pushing at all. Um, I see anything else about that? I don't think so. There's another question here. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I had a similar uh, remark, but now that you answered him, I can move forward. So yeah. um, I wanted to talk about employment and about um, uh, relations in need. So the first example that, that we say that private companies cannot handle things well is uh, Wisconsin uh, problem in Israel. But there is another example, because you, talk, you said that there is no competition there, and you're right in that case as well. But if we talk about social businesses, which is a field that uh, I happen to have a clue in. So, talking yesterday with one of the most um, prominent experts on the topic in Israel, she said, well, um, well, I, may, I might say a sentence about social businesses. Is, I'm talking now about these businesses that employ, you know, people like um, youth in danger or like um, people that will regularly not find uh, proper employment. Disabled people also. Yeah. So she says that usually people that start these businesses and go well are the ones that come from the social sector and not so much from the business world. Correct. Because people that come from the business world are usually, I mean, they give up because they don't have an actual center. Yeah. And that's an issue because people that come from the social sector don't have good enough clue in business. Yeah. So it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's a very interesting example. In America, it's a very common thing, this idea. There are, I mean, in our community where I live, we have a bakery, again, a bakery, it's a bakery day, that employs people who have uh, emotional issues, mental disabilities, physical handicaps. It's a beautiful, fantastic organization, and they make good cookies, right? Cookies are good, so we buy the cookies. If the cookies weren't good, we still might buy them because it's a beautiful thing to give people a, a job. The problem with most of those solutions is in English, we say they don't scale. Does that phrase, it's hard to make them much bigger. You can make them a little bigger, but in general, if you want to make them much bigger, you've got to have more of them, not a bigger one. So any efficiencies, any economies of scale are not going to work, and you need more and more, lots and lots of capable people with some, biz, some business ability, right? It's a big challenge. So uh, let me answer, we can time maybe for one more question, just but give you an example of, I think, the challenge. You've got compassionate people who don't know how to run businesses. And sometimes you have business people who aren't compassionate enough. And you kind of want, you want to mix, right? And it's very hard. Uh, there's a big revolution going on in America. I, another uh, Econ Talk episode I want to recommend is with a person named Dan Palota, P-A-L-O-T-T-A. -T -T -A, read his books. He wants, his argument is, we punish social businesses, we punish nonprofits because we, we judge them if they pay a competitive salary. Because we look at the overhead, it's called, right? We say, oh, what are their expenses? How much did they spend on fundraising? And he had a very interesting experience. He did a fundraiser to fight uh, AIDS, 
it was AIDS and something else. I can't remember. It might have been breast cancer. I can't remember. But it was a, a health cause. And he did a bike-a-thon to raise money for uh, AIDS. And he raised an unbelievable amount of money. But he spent a lot of money, too. But he raised more after you took out the expenses by a huge amount. But he still got criticized. Oh, you wasted all this. No, but he said, we have to compete for people's attention. We have to compete for their time. We have to do it really well. You want a talented person to run your business, your social business? You better pay them enough to pull in a person who knows enough business that they could have had a job that paid a lot more, but they come to this because they care about the cause. So that's one thing that's going on in America, a debate about how much should we be paying. A lot of people say, well, we shouldn't pay anything. They should just do it for the love. Maybe that's not the best solution. The other thing that happens is that the boards, what's the word, Bivrit? The, the what? Directorio, directory, yon. The directory yon of the social business, it used to be it was just people who wrote a lot of checks and <laughs> clapped a lot at the end of the year and thanked the people for all their good work. Now, in America, there's an increasing tendency, which I think is a good thing, for the directorion to be more involved in the execution of the business, whether it's a charity, a social business, a university, or whatever. And I think that's a good thing, because that expertise needs to be added to the process. One more question, maybe? Yeah. Um, it might be over theoretical, but I would love if you could maybe give some uh, guidelines to where government should intervene. And maybe an example of maybe a country that does it uh, well. Yeah. So when I, when, I, when I advocate for what I advocate, uh, people always say, OK, so give me a, an idea. Give me a country that's had uh, private education uh, for the poor. Well, actually, in India, there's a, a huge, huge, shockingly huge for-profit education system for children. And I, another Econ Talk interview I did with James Tooley, who studied that. He recently he got arrested in India, which is an interesting story, too. He recently wrote a book about that, a horrible story, but fascinating. But, it, but in India, people pay tiny amounts to teachers to teach their children. Uh, I think most of them are Muslim schools. They work pretty well. And there is a vibrant private sector for profit. I don't think that's the long run way to go in most countries. But in general, my system's never been tried, right? It's, a, it's an ideal. But that doesn't mean it wouldn't work. It's interesting. It's like people would say, oh, where is there a free market economy? Because the United States is not really a very free market economy. It has some free market elements. So yeah, give me your evidence. Well, it hasn't been tried. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It, it's a terrible answer, right? Uh, correct. That's true. Well, I, I was going to say something else, but that's true too, right? So you have to ask in, in practice, how would it work? Would it work well or not, right? But the idea that, that, that there is um, uh, that I can point to some historical evidence or, or current evidence, there is evidence for my viewpoint, but it's not like big evidence, like, oh, well, look at this country. They got rid of, well, you could say the United States was such a thing. You could say Hong Kong was such a thing. There are examples where people moved way away from lots of government to smaller government and did better. But that's not a proof. There's a thousand things happening at the same time. It's complicated. Uh, but it's suggestive. But the more first question, the theoretical question is, you have to think about where the feedback loops are going to work and where they're not going to work. And we understand that somewhat, I believe. I believe there is, uh, the obvious examples are externalities and public goods, right? I would never suggest, although I'm in favor of a volunteer army, I would never suggest funding it via uh, private donations. I don't think that would work very well. I don't think it would raise very much money. Uh, I think that would be a, could be a problem in a modern era where you need very large expenditures for certain types of weapon systems, defense systems, et cetera. I mean, it might work, but that wouldn't be my first place to try leaving things alone, right? But I think there are other places, and especially where the feedback loops of profit and loss work well, I think part of my lesson, part of my theme today, 
is that interfering with those feedback loops is problematic. Okay? So just again to take an example from the financial crisis, starting around 1984 in the United States, certainly in the, in the 80s, certainly in the 90s, certainly in, uh, in the 80s and 90s, the United States, the government told banks that lent money where the investments, the loans didn't do well, you can have all your money back. That basically told them to lend money less carefully. That's not, that's not mysterious to me. I think that was a terrible mistake because the feedback loop of profit and loss, right? Profits encourage risk taking, losses encourage taking care and caution and prudence. If you cut those feedback loops, you're going to have problems. Now, I don't think that in the next six years or six weeks or six months, Israel is going to embrace free market ideals. It'd be great if they did, I think. It'd be good for Israel, good for the people of Israel, good for not just rich people, but all the people of Israel almost. I think that would be a good thing. But I think what you can take away from this talk is this idea that where you draw the line matters. Okay? You might not draw it where I draw it. But I want you to think about that question. Where do you draw the line of what's good for the government to do? It might not be prisons for the private sector. It might be that's a good line thing for the government to do, right? But you might be other places that you could imagine could something work out better if it was left alone. I mean, an obvious example, the biggest problem I think in Israel today is housing. And I think that's partly caused by the fact that the government owns much of the land in Israel and restricts how it's used. And my guess is there's some, some tycoon problems there of people who are already profiting from the fact that their land is scarce, who already have the land, who already have the buildings, and that's just a huge disaster. So it's not just, oh, this perfect ideal versus this other extreme. On any one issue, I think you could think about ways that feedback loops are either being distorted or maybe could be the whole issue could be left in a different, in, with a different structure. Anyway, thanks, thanks so much. We have a break now and then back at 10.30, right?